<clears throat> Please be opening your Bibles to the New Testament, to the Gospel account of John, chapter 4. We'll be reading verses 20 through 24. If you turn on your televisions to watch any of the modern day presentations regarding religion, if you watch a number of those things, usually you hear something like, what an exciting worship experience. And it goes on from there. I would like for us to spend a little time today concerning the matter of true worship. I think anyone that understands what the Bible is will recognize that it is the I say the primary source material when it comes to Christianity or anything that pertains to it. It's the Holy Spirit inspired Word of God. It is infallible. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's put here to lead and guide and direct us in all things and therefore it means that we study it to learn about worship. Now let me begin reading with that in mind from Jesus' meeting with the woman of Samaria, a portion of that that concerns our subject. And you find beginning in verse number 20, the woman saying, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now let's keep in mind that this is the days when the law of Moses was still Israel's approach to God, their standard. Verse 21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit. Now in the Greek it just says God is spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him. Notice the must. Imperative must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The word translated worship most in the Greek language of the New Testament is proskuneo. It carries with it the idea of falling down before someone to do obeisance to them and to show them your devotion. So you see, it's not only a disposition of mind, but it's that disposition of mind presented in an action. Humility before the one who you adore. So I'd like for us to keep that in mind regarding the basic understanding of our worship of God. You hear things today, and I want you to hold these points in mind that we read from John 4. We consider the matter of worship. We're talking about true worship. We want to look some at what people have done to worship. The idea of exciting worship experience means to many a place to experience God through what they would say awesome services. You ever notice how we are creatures from a few, every few years that picks up a certain word and we just camp on it? Uh, back in the 60s, it was relevant. Everything's relevant. And just relevant till it was relevated. Well, now it's awesome. Everything I hear, awesome God, awesome this, awesome that. I wish sometimes we'd think, where did I ever learn there was that word? And don't you have a little more vocabulary than just that word? What'd you do before you learned that word existed? But that's what happens. And it harries with it the idea of fun events and all that goes along with it. We believe that uh, church, as they would say, should be exciting and fun. 
where kids experience God through worship and dramatic skits and all sorts of things likened thereunto. All designed to provide an exciting worship experience. Many or all of these phrases can be found and have been for a long time in the human churches, the denominations. That pretty well describes their worship periods. At least what they call worship. Sadly, ever so sadly, for some time now, some churches of Christ, to one extent or another, have some of these ideas, or all of them, these kinds of events, celebrate this, and celebrate that, celebrate recovery, and dedicate your baby, and divided worship assemblies where the kids all run off over somewhere, and the adults are all over here. You know, that goes on with our age. Get them out of our hair. And there's a whole lot to that. You got one assembly supposedly worshiping that's for the adults, and you got one for the kids. And, buddy, I'm waiting for one for those 65 and older. Because I'm not going to go and have it. I'm trying to figure out what the one worship assembly of the first day of the week really is. And when it says not forsaking the assembling any official assemblies of the church, as a matter of some is, if you begin to divide up the assembly, assemblies convene for religious purposes, specifically for worship. Finally, there's nothing to forsake. Think about it for a minute. You got people who, preachers are as big a problem with this, if they're not the problem, and a whole lot of it who are supposed to be stand-up comics. I really believe they watch Jay Leno and people like that to determine what joke they're going to tell. We've heard for a long time folks going to the Reader's Digest and coming up with all this kind of thing. I sum it up by saying sermonettes for Christianettes. You see minds that are feeding on all of this in the world and they bring it into the church and so people have to satisfy all of that. They rarely think about an in-depth study of the Bible. That's a novel idea in a worship assembly in the sermon, isn't it? Much less the first principles concerning how to become a Christian and live the Christian life. You don't see things being brought out about here's what the Scripture is, here's what it means, and here's what it means in your life. Especially if it says, don't do this and don't do that, for that's verboten when it comes to, to preaching. You just... Don't tell people no. It's politically incorrect. You don't want to be negative. You dare not be negative. Now, it's good to be negative negativism. So you are negative some things, which shows you the illogic in the mind of a person. How can you be opposed to negativism without being opposed to negativism? Whatever they define it to mean. There's all sorts of worship you'll see on the marquee's Traditional worship, such a time, and contemporary worship. I pick up your Bible and find that one in the New Testament. I don't read the Lord saying uh, to the Samaritan woman, Now the hour comes, and now is, when the traditional worshipers will worship here, and those contemporary, I don't know how that would work 2,000 years ago. That seems a bit old. We're in an age that says, Do away with anything that's been used a few times. Take up something new. Well, why? Is it better? No, it's new. <laughs> the other is we've done it so long, we're, it, we're tired of it. We're, it. It just beats us around, and I don't get anything out of it. And that's, that's the attitude. All too often, sermons and lessons are only aimed at some kind of an emotional response with the use of stories of somewhat or the other, deathbed tales and illustrations and Little or no scripture, like one fellow said, he chose his text and he preached everywhere from Dan to Beersheba. What did the text mean? Why was there such a thing as a text? So these exciting worship experiences, the very idea of that, words have meanings, they convey thoughts, they, can, they convey ideas and viewpoints, uh, are, are something to consider. 
because I think you'll find any disposition of heart that heads for that is going to eventually set aside the Word of God as to what they want because that becomes the primary foundational point that guides them. Something new. I want you to go back with me to the Old Testament. Go with me to the book of Exodus and you'll remember when you get here exactly what it was. Let's read verses 1 through 6 of chapter 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we will not what's become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. All the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron saw it. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. They rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So then, of course, God had something to say about that. And when you look over to verses 19, <clears throat> beginning of verse 19, through verse 22, the scripture reads, And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh, that's Moses, under the camp, that he saw the calf, now watch it, and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. <laughs> that does seem a bit negative on the part of Moses, doesn't it? And he cast the tables out of his hands and broke them beneath the mount. That's the Ten Commandments. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strode it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? Now it gets good right here so the excuses people make. And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people, that they are set on mischief. You know, I stop and I read that and I say, Well, didn't you know that too? <laughs> for they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know what happened to him. <laughs> and I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, and he repeats himself there. And I like the latter part of that verse. And then I cast it in the fire, and there came out this calf. Have people really changed? Now you can see something of what was going on. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under their own shame among their enemies, and so on. It goes along with the idolatrous worship. Now, now look what you've got. The people, the scripture says, gathered to Aaron. We ought to think about that. They came together as a group to Aaron and they presented what they thought they wanted. And evidently they did. Now one man or two or three men may have come to Aaron and he may have stood his ground. But when you get a large group together, it makes it rather difficult for a single man to stand up. He's got to have a lot of courage. And so we might as well expect our courage when it comes to primitive, pure New Testament Christianity being practiced to be challenged. And we might as well realize that a majority of preacher, uh, people can really challenge that when it comes to our standing for what is right. Notice they say, we don't know what happened to Moses. Well, what does that mean? Go back at the instructions that Moses gave them when he was away. And that should have been just fine. They then took advantage of Moses' absence. You mark it down. People who are weak in the faith or don't have any or their rebellious nature, they know when to choose to move to get what they want. 
And Aaron said to them, well, what did Aaron say to them? Well, first of all, he didn't question them. He didn't remind them that Moses is doing what God wanted him to do, and he'll be down when God's through with him. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't challenge their decision. He simply did as this group of people asked him to do. You know, many times those who stand for the truth are literally outnumbered. If you look through the Bible, you'll see that over and over again. In fact, God wanted Israel to understand if you accomplish anything, it will be because of your adherence to my word and your faith in me and keeping my commandments. He wouldn't even let the people normally take a census so that they would not trust in the power of numbers. You are what you are because of your faith in me and keeping my commandments. And over and over and over and over again, he'd say that's the only way you're going to remain where you are is to trust in me based on my word. But notice what you have in the book of Ezekiel that has a little bearing on some of what we're talking about. In Ezekiel 22, and Ezekiel was over in the first captives in the Babylonian captivity doing the same work in preaching to those already in captivity that Jeremiah was doing in the last siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 22 and verse number 30, <clears throat> we're talking about courage. And the minority standing against the majority when the majority wants to do wrong. Listen to what God said as to one of the reasons He destroyed Jerusalem. Beginning in verse 30, or we'll just read that verse. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Now look at the next verse. Therefore, that's remember a conclusion on the basis of what I said in verse 30 is why I did what I'm doing and doing what I did. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Look. For just one to stand on the basis of the truth and the truth alone to demonstrate faith in God and His system and he couldn't find anybody. So I'll wipe them off. That is a tremendous statement. Notice that to Aaron, they, his crowd then said, or, or he said, and they, they wanted it that way, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Well, there's never been a greater lie uttered by anybody than that one. Aaron knew better than that. In fact, you'll notice what he's saying. Here is the calf. We'll worship the Lord. That's interesting. The people then are now pleased because they're, they're doing what they desire. They're now worshiping of sorts. But it's a useless false god. But they're worshiping as they please. Notice Jesus said to the woman at the well, God seeks such to worship Him. Who are the such? Those that worship Him in spirit, disposition of mind, properly educated in the worship of God, directing worship toward God, and truth as the Word of God leads, guides, and directs us. That should be the main, as the fellow said, the mainest thing on somebody's mind. Sometimes, we get calls, and it has been over the years, and it'll be for some family, or they visit, and you'll talk to them and visit with them and try to be as cordial as you know how. And after you sort of break the ice, or maybe they'll, as I say, call on the phone, they'll say, oh, what do you have for us? What do you have for our young people? It's so sad many times we go on the defensive for we, we, we miss an excellent time to teach them something. Does anybody ever think as a member of a church it strives to be faithful in walking the straight and narrow way of truth and opposing all other things that we have the obligation to God and to our brothers and sisters in this congregation and to be true of any faithful congregation to turn around and ask them 
No, that's not what you need to be interested in right now. If we're faithful in all things, you, you need to know that we need to ask you, what do you bring to us that will make us a stronger Christian? What are you doing that God said mom and daddy ought to do and must do to rear their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Do you think the church is charged to be what God put mom and daddy here to be? We offer the Bible taught in classes. We have fellowship one with another based upon the truth of God's Word. What are you really looking for? That's another great question. People need to be asked that. What are you looking for? So young families today have grown up, and it's happening right now, and you mark it down. During a time of 24 hours, 7 days a week, entertainment. These families have become used to it. It's a part of their very, the fabric of their being. And it's entertainment at the click of a button or mouse. And for that reason, many expect the same thing in the worship of God. And it's all done for them. Jesus says, true worship begins within you in your knowledge, which knowledge will be God's will as to what worship is. Worship is where you engage from the heart in acts that show your devotion and homage to God. And it's a matter of worshiping God, not worshiping you and pleasing you. Now you watch anything on television today, for the most part it's what can we do to make a three ring circus a four ring circus. God's pretty well left out because the idea is if it pleases me, oh, God will take it. And that's been back there all the way to the time of Cain. Cain worshipped God. But it was wrong worship. He offered what was not authorized and it suited him. It certainly didn't suit God. So while entertainment today has a big part to play in this problem, the real genuine problem is that many do not know what kind of worship is pleasing to God because they don't understand what the Christian life's all about in the first place. The denominations and their preachers have no understanding about what God demands and worship to Him. Denominations exist to give people a choice in how they do what they want to. The idea is you believe in Christ as your Savior. Now you pick a denomination that suits you. If it wasn't for that disposition, there wouldn't be any denominations. But that's not what you find in John 4, 20 through 24. The desire to create a fun place for children in seeking a church with which to place membership is the attitude that says, what can you do for our children? Questions that come to mind that could be asked parents like that are myriad. What are you doing for your children? How much Bible are you reading and studying with them? Are you worshiping with them in the home? Do you know what worship is? Do you know how to do it? What do you expect from the church on the basis of what the Lord's will for the church is? And they have no idea about that. As parents are entertained by all sorts of whatever in the auditorium, then the children are being entertained by snacks and puppets and drama and basically anything that will keep these kids wanting to come back. Everything, but plain Bible teaching on their level of understanding that brings about the idea of sobriety and self-control and submission to God's Word. And the truth of the matter is, children are oftentimes running the show anyway. If the children aren't being taught what true worship is, then what's keeping them around? They've not been taught what true teaching and worship is because their parents cannot teach what they don't know. The desire to become attractive to people who have become bored with the the, the, the current worship period, as it was put out when I was a young man back in the 60s, is are you going to church and enjoying it less? I remember in a class a long time ago where the preacher was pointing out, if you do not live close to God Monday through Saturday, 
in your studying of the Bible, your meditation on it, your prayers, your being mindful of the example you set before your people you work with and at school, then you're going to seek some sort of emotional pitch on Sunday or you don't, quote, feel like you worshiped. The worship that is set out in the Bible, such as we've engaged in today, are acts that come from the heart. And have you ever noticed how really simple it is? But that it allows for every Christian at their stage of growth and develop spiritually to pour all they've got within themselves into it to show their love of God and their devotion to God. And there may be a man there 50 years old or a woman uh, 80. And they've been members of the church for years and years and years and years. And there may be somebody there just baptized a year ago. And yet as they all worship according to the authority of Christ in spirit, from the heart, in truth, as the truth directs, all that worship pouring out from experienced worship to the novice worship is acceptable to God. Because the worship of the church as it's set out in the five acts of worship allows you to put all that you are spiritually at that stage of your life into it to show God how much you care. It's a simple thing. But it certainly is profound in what it draws from you when your mind is where it ought to be. Many worship leaders, if you call them that, can create some kind of an atmosphere, an environment that is filled with all kind of, I call it bench jumping, jumping and clapping and whatever goes on that doesn't cause anybody to understand how better to live the Bible and glorify God in obedience to His will. You've got praise teams. You've got every kind of singing group. As I said, you have dramatic skits and so on. And all of that's aimed at pleasing you. Well, yes, we are worshiping someone, but it's God. Now I ask the question, how does God in His Son's last will and testament teach us to worship so we can please Him? He's the audience. We in worshiping God in spirit and in truth are performing our acts of devotion from the heart to Him. Now, what do you think about your worship today thus far? What was on your mind? What were you thinking about? So you see, there's, there's mental discipline involved in worshiping God in spirit and in truth. There's the exercise of yourself to keep it in harmony with the will of Christ as it's presented in the Word of Christ. You can let your mind drift all over the place. But for the one who worships God in spirit and in truth, there is that exercise to keep it where it ought to be as we show our devotions to God and engaging from the heart in the acts of worship that we have here this day. Notice what is said by the psalmist. In Psalm 96, 7 and 8. Psalm 96, 7 and 8. Give. Notice that's action. Give unto the Lord. O ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before Him in all the earth. Through verse 9. Do you see the solemnity? which is unheard of in this day and age of frivolity. Do you see the reverence? That's an all. If you want something new, try solemnity. Try reverence. Try being still and know that I'm God. Try to create an atmosphere by your actions that encourages listening. That is mindful as you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's worshipers in this case. Encouraging them to center on Jesus and the Father. Because there's so much hoopla, really worship is turned into a pep rally. Sort of like before some big football game. And that's gone on for years. It's just gotten worse. And many of us are like the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai. Here's what we want. We certainly don't know the truth of God, but here's what we want. 
And that's what they seek after. And there's always going to be an Aaron there. There always will be. Just throw it in the fire and out jumps a calf. Many are being shown the idea that unless the service is emotional, that it's not scriptural. Well, I believe in the emotions of man. God made them. God made them for our good. I don't believe he ever intended the emotions to be the chief guiding factor in, in your life. Emotions, when they're properly used, come out because you know intellectually the truth of God and that you have, if you're going to rejoice, complied with that truth. People have been taught to equate some emotional frenzy as a spiritual experience. And go back to what I said a while ago. When you're involving yourself in all the affairs of this world and forgetting Monday through Saturday what godliness is in your day-to-day -day living, then of course you want to try to work yourself into a frenzy because you've got to have that feeling that you've worshipped. In fact, that very action ought to tell you you're not what you ought to be Monday through Saturday. In reality, it's genuine scriptural worship. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth that pierces our hearts. That causes us to think deeply about our own relationship to God. His love for us. Our spiritual condition. And if we are honest, conclude from God's word that we're either lost in sin and need to obey the gospel or that we are rejoicing because we have, we're faithful Christians, or maybe as a child of God that one needs to change. Or rejoicing that you have found the Lord, that you are faithful, enjoying the presence of others who are worshiping in spirit and in truth too, your brothers and sisters of the Lord, that you can shut out the world for a while and show God without interference according to His will and by doing His will how much love there is on your part. Sometimes we separate two words that ought not be separated, and that is devotion and worship. Brethren, when we worship, we are engaged in devotion, and when we are in our devotions, we are worshiping God. Whether it's in this assembly convened for that purpose, or whether it's in our home or wherever we are. Then we can, as the eunuch did, having heard the truth concerning salvation and knew it and then obeyed it and knew he'd obeyed it. You can rise up from that obedience in his case having become a Christian when he was baptized to walk in newness of life and go on your way rejoicing. You know that you complied with God's terms of pardon and that in so doing your sins are cleansed and God holds them against you no more and that the Lord himself has added you to his blood-bought body of the church. You're grateful for the fellowship of the saints, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Similarly, emotions are felt when we ask for prayers of the congregation or for forgiveness from others. Or we're caused to think about things brought to our minds by the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. After all, the Bible says that aspect of worship is we sing those songs and we direct them to God while we're teaching one another. As we make melody in our hearts to the Lord. Or the words of the prayer leaders that helps us form our, our particular thoughts for ourselves and for others. You see, when it comes to engaging from the heart in each act of worship authorized by God in this first day of the week assembly, your mind is busy staying your mind on the truth of each act. There's no time for it to wander. If you're just going through the motions, you can wander all over the place. But when you're thinking about the singing and the words of the song and the attitude of the heart and who you're directing it to and what it means to everybody around you, how can you think of anything else? But it, but it must be with the disciplined mind. And the same is true when it comes to prayers. Where's your mind when the fellow's leading us in prayer? And to those who lead us, you are leading everybody there in prayer. Choose your words. I want to encourage us here. To realize when you're at the table where, you, where I am as a preacher, leading prayer or singing songs. Don't 
Choose your words as if everybody in that audience is as familiar with things as you are. Choose your words, because they're signs of ideas, on the basis of maybe people here who have no idea what's going on. And frankly, if you listen to some of the things we say, they're said for the benefit of educated folks. That is, educated in what we're doing. And we don't give thought to what we're saying before we say it are the words that we choose. It ought to be enough just to know we're going before God to lead the congregation in prayer that we should give thought to those things. But think about the people who come in. It bothers me to a great extent throughout the whole of the church of how much we think when people come visiting, they just know what's going on. And we expect out of them maybe even in their dress and conduct. Things that you can only expect out of a person who's been educated in the truth on how to live the gospel because they've already become Christians. Don't deal with the people outside the church like they're already Christians. They're not. Deal with them for what they are. And be mindful what you say and what you have to say about it. I want to look at a couple of songs relative to what I'm talking about is to worship. One of them on page 257. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Tell me how you can sing that, thinking of the words, and be flippant, and bounce around like a flea on a hot griddle. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them unto His blood. Instead, some people's idea of worship today is that we build up those vain things and think we're spiritual in the doing of it to glorify God. See from His head, His hands, His feet, Sorrow and love so mingle down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Are thorns composed so rich a crown? Now what's formed in your mind when you sing that song thinking about it? Were the whole realm of nature mine? That were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine. Demands my soul. My life, my all. Now hooked it all over the place and see how that fits the meaning of those words that you worship from the heart and direct it to God. It doesn't work unless you're paying no attention to it, unless you've got a false concept. One more song. Think of, you don't see much of this nowadays, majesty, reverence, Listen to this, 618. On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host redeemed by blood. They hymned their king in strains divine. I heard the song and strove to join. I heard the song and strove to join. Hear all who suffered sword or flame for truth or Jesus' lovely name. Shout victory now and hail the Lamb and bow before the great I Am and bow before the great I Am. While everlasting ages roll, eternal love shall feast their soul and scenes of bliss forever new rise in succession to their view. Rise in succession to their view. Holy, holy, holy. God of hosts on high adore, who like me thy praise should sing, O Almighty God our King. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts on high adore, holy, holy, holy. Now I have a three ring circus. If your mind's on the meaning of those words coming through your heart and they're all in harmony with God's will, what is that cultivating in you and saying to your brothers and sisters and everybody else around you? And it's right the opposite 
of some of the things people are talking about. You know, 2 Corinthians 9 says of our giving, giving that every man according as he purposes it in his heart. It's true of everything we do in the worship. You go back through anything about the Old Testament and you go to Leviticus, which is Israel's approach to God through the Levitical priesthood, and certainly that covers so much about worship. And you read through there and see over and over and over again how much is emphasized on holiness, sobriety, self-control, seeing reality for what it is, what you really are, letting yourself be seen as God sees you in His Word. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed, James 1.25. So where there's all kinds of goings on that fit more the way the world does stuff, then we can just expect this kind of thing to permeate and hit us. Unscriptural, exciting worship leads God's people into false worship because they don't understand what they should. Let me ask you to do one thing regarding singing. I venture most of us haven't done it. This song book we've used for years. How many of you have ever took it home and sat out with your family and gone through these songs and read them as a poem and talked about the meaning of them? It'll make a big difference to you. There are even words in these songs that I promise you, as we talk about them time to time, we don't know what they mean. We sing them now. I want to know what God thinks about that. How can that be in truth, even in spirit? There's all sorts of things we can do to improve ourselves when it comes to Christianity, and worshiping God is one of them. If you go to the closing chapters of the book of Revelation, and we'll conclude here, it's interesting that in the last chapter, in verses 8 and 9, listen to what John says. 22nd chapter 8 and 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Now listen to the angel's reaction. And this is the second time this happens in the book. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant. And of the brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. What a fitting way to close the divine volume, especially when he points out in verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the book of this prophecy, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Just before the pen of inspiration is laid down forevermore, he concludes with verses 20 and 21 as we have it in our Bibles. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Brethren, we need to revamp ourselves sometimes in what we're doing to make sure that we do not drift. And I don't know why it is, but when we do things over and over again, those things become commonplace. And sometimes we really don't think about just what we do. It shouldn't be that way. Sometimes you take your time to look into the Bible on how much is really taught about what's involved in worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And surely as members of His church, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as Christians, worshiping God ought to be one of the most important things that we understand when it comes to living the Christian life. We've studied what to do to become a Christian this morning, and we urge you to be obedient to the gospel. As a child of God, if you've sinned, Publicly, come confessing it and praying, God, for forgiveness, evidencing your repentance. Why not do so now while we stand and sing?